Hi guys, I'm Roland Judd. Uh, this is Jake White. We're working on book for the summer. I got our presentation going. So. All right. So what we do is sort of a science, computer science uh, project. So um, we work with uh, a computational astrophysics group. Um, so it's a combination between or a joint venture between the computer science department here and the physics department. Yeah. So what we do is we are trying to characterize the dark matter uh, characteristics of the Milky Way. So to do that, we look at um, dwarf galaxies that are currently colliding with the Milky Way. You can see in this picture here, um, the dwarf galaxies come in and then they kind of stretch out due to tidal forces and create these streams. And um, the streams kind of give us an idea of the evolution of the dwarf galaxy through the potential that was the Milky Way. And that's really all you need to get from the slide to understand what we're doing. Um, some of the motivation behind this uh, is that dark matter is seen through what are called uh, rotation curves currently. And so we have these distributions that we assume that the dark matter must follow to get the observed uh, velocities for the rotation curve. But we kind of want to probe that a little bit better. And you can do that because the streams pass through this potential. So you can map as it's passing through what the potential has to be like to get what we see today. Um, we do this with a project called Milky Way Home, which is a Berkeley open infrastructure for network computer computing product, project or a point project. Um, it's a massively distributed uh, parallel computing uh, volunteer network, which we currently have uh, 24,375 users with credit. Um, a lot of them actually have more than one computer running on our network. So that's 33,000 computers with recent credit, and we have about half a petaflop of computational power behind us right now. Um, some of the capabilities that we have are optimizing very difficult and complex uh, surfaces, a lot of local vests. So we do our global optimizations, and we're trying to, in the case of our n-body application, um, fit what starting parameters you need to throw the, the dwarves into the galaxy's potential um, to get what we see currently with the stars that we can look up and observe with our separation application. Um, something we have to keep in mind when we're running this on the Boyd infrastructure is uh, it has to be fault tolerant because you can on occasion have computers that are just, maybe they downloaded the wrong application or they compiled their own application and it's not working properly. Uh, it can give us bad results and we need to be able to uh, check those results based or check those results against other users returning uh, results of the same work unit and make sure that everyone's re uh, reaching a quorum before we actually accept the result. Um, and like I said, it's massively asynchronous. It can take up to two weeks for one user to send us back uh, what we call a work unit or a single set of parameters that we're trying to optimize. Um, so we have to be able to go with basically the information we have so far. So maybe the last 500 that we got back, last 500 work units, um, we'll make an educated, based, educated guess based on that instead of needing all of the users to return their information. Okay, so the way the server is set up right now, um, the server is what generates the work units. Uh, we use something called a toolkit for asynchronous optimization. Um, and what that does is it generates parameter <coughs> sets from the data, from the work units that have been returned. So it looks at the results it has already, and then using different asynchronous um, algorithms like particle swarm, differential evolution, it generates new work units uh, to try and approach the local or global maximum. Um, so going over this slide real quickly, uh, the uh, tau for short, toolkit for asynchronous optimization, generates the parameters, sends those to the work unit generator. The work unit is then sent to the client application. The work unit includes the executable, um, the parameters for that particular run, as well as any um, files that you need to compute the likelihood value. And that's sent to the client. The client runs that. Um, they can take from 10 minutes to a couple hours to run one work unit. Uh, that sends back a likelihood value, which is right now a single photo point number, which corresponds to how well those parameters fit our model. Um, the work unit validator um, makes sure that multiple computers return the same 
uh, result. So you can't have one computer returning random, random numbers. Uh, so it sends out the same work unit to two or three computers and then verifies that they all have the same number. Uh, work unit simulator, that's another program running on the server that stores the results of the work units in the database. And, yeah. <laughs> so we have a couple different options that we can use for our um, educated guesses. So we have a low energy global search option, which is the differential evolution. And um, it can find a solution quickly, but it doesn't necessarily search the entire parameter space. So uh, the benefit here is that we get a quick convergence to an answer. Um, the problem is it's not always the best answer. Then we also have high energy global search solutions, which they're high energy, so they get to spread out in the parameter space and search the parameter space more thoroughly. But this takes longer to run. Um, but you're more likely to get to the global best if you're using the particle swarm versus the differential evolution because it's a higher energy search solution. Um, the problem is when we're running our application, uh, nBody takes between 30,000 and 40,000 return results to get a converged solution. And that's an accurate converged solution to what we think is the global best. Um, also, it's not guaranteed to be the global best because these are global optimizations and it's very difficult to do. Um, so you're just randomly guessing, so you're not guaranteed to get the best. Um, so the particle swarm, like I said, better searches the, the space. So if you need a solution quickly, you'll get the solution quickly. Um, and then separation, which is the other application we run, takes about 100,000 return results to get a converged solution. Just because of the nature of the parameter spaces that we're looking at. So we have up to 20 parameters in our parameter space right now, and we can have more in the future. So it's very, very complicated parameter space. So I think we've already touched on all this stuff already, so we'll skip over to that. Um, so like I said, we have two applications currently running on Milky Way at home. The first one is separation, which we used to find those stellar streams I pointed out on the first slide. Um, basically, we have to characterize their densities and their positions so that we can later use them in our n-body application to roll them. So the n-body application is uh, a gravitational modeling program which models the way systems interact in, in space. Um, we'll go into more about how it works later. Um, it was originally, or a significant amount of work was done on n-body through Arcos by Matthew Arsenal, I think in 2010 or something like that. So uh, it's been on the project forever. So n-body simulations are a simulation of a large number of particles under different forces. It could be gravity, it could be electrostatics, it could be anything. Um, and because of the nature of the problem, there's no uh, analytical solution to it. So you have to do it by numerical integration and figure out how the system is going to evolve in time. So the algorithm we use for this is barnes hot it's a octree-based um, force computation algorithm. If you do a direct summation of all the forces, it would be um, like n squared one time, because you have to calculate for every single possible pair of particles. So what the barnes hot algorithm does is it approximates particles that are a sufficient distance from the one you're currently uh, calculating. So it reduces the uh, complexity to n log n. So for 100,000 particles, it makes it feasible to actually do a, a 4 billion year simulation. So the n-body client application, uh, it receives the work unit, which has the parameters uh, as a Lua file, which is used to set up the initial state of the particles. Um, the reason it's set up that way is because you can generate any random arbitrary configuration you want with Lua. Um, it was originally set up with like a JSON input, but that was restricted to certain cases that were hard-coded into the application. So with Lua, you can call C functions and set up whatever simulation you want. Uh, so the, the application has a built-in interpreter. It uses the Lua file to generate the initial state. And then we have a multi-thread C version and an OpenCL version of the actual force computation and integration part. Uh, the OpenCL version is not really working currently. That's what I'm going to be working on most of the summer. Um, and then that runs for whatever time interval we specify. 
and then we look at the results and calculate a likelihood based off what we observe after the simulation is over. Uh, the likelihood calculation uses a histogram of the data. So on the next couple of slides, we'll show you some examples, but it basically uh, looks at the density of the stars in the sky and compares that to uh, data that was observed through the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. I'd just like to add about the Lua files that it adds the capability of changing some of the fundamental properties of our runs. So we can add or change the number of dwarfs we're using or something, for example, or something to that nature without having to recompile the entire code and re-release a new version to our users. <laughs> so between runs, we can do very drastically different things with what we're trying to optimize um, without having to burden our users at all with getting new application versions or recompiling their application versions if that's what they choose to do. So originally we uh, used a one-dimensional histogram format for our likelihood function calculations for uh, the end bodies. So what we would do is we would look at the, the title stream that we would get at the end and we would just look at um, bins in, along one small section of that, uh, that stream and then try to match that with data that we can see, which is just another histogram. So what we use is a, an algorithm called Earth Movers Distance to match the shapes of these histograms. And Earth Movers Distance is really nice because if you have your, the same histogram just shifted over by one bin, um, you'll actually get a really good likelihood out, which tells you that maybe just the time that you ran your uh, application was just a little bit too long or something like that. Um, the problem is, that because you're not necessarily going to have the same number of stars in each of those bins, or mass proxies is what we actually use for the end body simulations, um, you can't necessarily weight the two histograms the same. So we have to also add in a cost function that we use to come up with the difference in the masses between each of the bins, because they're actually normalized when we go to the Earth moves distance. So, like I said, we have the one dimensional histograms that we started with. And you can see uh, one of these streams that we have in our simulation down in the picture in the corner. Um, and we would just turn that into one of the histograms you see on the left, and then we would try and match it with a data histogram that looks almost exactly the same as one on the um, And what we're trying to do over this summer is make two-dimensional histograms out of our data. So instead of just using one small, thin, little, wet, uh, little stream along our two-dimensional histogram, or our, our data, we're now spreading that out to two dimensions so we can get a, a better fit. And you'll see a, a movie at the end where this would actually come in really good handy uh, for showing that the likelihood that we get from the movie at the end should be actually a lot worse than what we get. Um, and this here is just an example of what our new 2D histograms look like. Um, we spent the last two weeks or so uh, implementing this. Um, so basically, if you go back to this slide, um, you can imagine this histogram as uh, if you cut out like an angular slice of this stream and then plot the density along that angle. Uh, that's what that histogram represents, just in case that wasn't clear to any of you guys. Um, and then the new version of the 2D is um, it's basically, if you looked up at the sky, what you would see as how the stars would be spread out across, across the sky, I guess. Um, there's also a small issue here where the bins don't seem to line up properly. We're not exactly sure what that is yet, so we're going to be working on that the next week to try to figure out why that, that's a problem. Um, so this is an example of actual data that you can look up and see. And this isn't necessarily bin, but you can see based on the, uh, the brightness where more, most of the stars are. Actually, I do think it is bin. So this is a two-dimensional histogram of actual data. And you can see the streams in the picture here. Um, this here is the Manasseur stream, and these here are the Sagittarius streams, and the bifurcated piece of the Sagittarius stream. And you can't really see it too well on this projector, but there's a red stream right here, which is the Orphan stream, which is what we've actually tried, uh, been trying to match recently uh, with our end body runs that are currently running on Milky Way at home. The problem is, like I said, with the one-dimensional histograms, it's really hard to get a, a realistic or physical solution to our problem. Okay, so the end body parameters, these are what we are trying to optimize with the program. 
So the six parameters are passed to the client from the from the work unit generator, um, and these parameters then are used in the Lua script to set up the simulation. Um, I could explain what exactly what they are, but uh, I'll be able to matters. Um, Currently, we're only trying to optimize the properties of the dwarf galaxies we're throwing it, but we'd like to eventually be able to start optimizing the potentials that we're throwing it into as well, so that we can kind of, like I said before, probe the different distributions of dark matter and light matter throughout the galaxy a little bit better. And this is just a demo of what an actual simulation looks like when you run it um, through Milky Way at home on the client's computer. So you see the, the dwarf galaxy that we throw in actually starts to expand and kind of explode at the beginning, which shows that it might not be too stable in our current uh, potential that we're using for the Milky Way. Um, and at the end, you're going to notice that it's actually a, a really wide screen, which we can't tell when we try to match the histograms right now, because we're only looking at the, the one dimension along the, the length of the screen here. So, what we're trying to do is uh, get the two-dimensional Earth movers distance working so we can match two-dimensional histograms and get a better picture of what we're actually looking at and get better likelihood surfaces for us to search over. Um, uh, so this summer, uh, the first couple of weeks, we were going to implement two-dimensional histograms, two-dimensional Earth mover distance. We've mostly completed that already. We still have to write the likelihood function for 2D, but the histograms are working uh, correctly. Uh, after that, we're going to start working on the GPU stuff, the open scale kernels, and try and get those working and release to users at some point. Uh, they're really ugly, but. We're also going to make some modifications to the separation code I was working on last summer through our code, which is um, just kind of changing the way that the server optimizes the parameters that I implemented last summer. And just a special thanks to everyone at Milky Way at home, everyone here, um, Arcos, Professor Goldschmidt, Professor Morthy, and Sean O'Sullivan, of course. Does anyone have any questions? With uh, sending over Lua files, are yeah. you like looking at like security for that? Um, is if you're sending over code that the client can run, it could be easy for someone to be like, no, we're not gonna like set up the simulation. We're just gonna run like Bitcoin mining or something like that. Okay, so <laughs> um, the executables that the clients run um, are signed, uh -huh. but I'm not sure if the Lua file is important into that. It's uh, it's not. Um, um, but the, the little files are only calling the C function bindings in the C code anyway. Okay. So it's not really running any code on its own, it's just calling different functions that we already have written in the executable. And all of the executable code is actually on GitHub open source, so anyone on the project who wants to run our code can actually go and look at the code themselves, compile their own version if they want, or whatever. Yeah, no, it can just be like one of those things where someone decides to break into your server and then Modified code, but if you guys have security, yep. that, you know. yeah, that's, that is a possible <laughs> concern. Um, but if they broke into our server, they could just just as easily modify the actual application. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, that's fair. <laughs> and it downloads a Lua file with uh, secure connection and stuff. So right. that's fine. I mean, there are some potential vulnerabilities, but uh, anything else?